Yeah. You all right? The uh, 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 we're Buddy and the boys. They <laughs> hide. They're this way, Governor. Over there. Come on, it's your y'all shop. Come on, join it. <laughs> Come on. Lake right there, hon. Hi. Come on, guys. Yeah. Hello, Shop. Yeah. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. How are you doing? Hey, uh, oh, not, not my boys. Here, you guys. Uh, you uh, guys can go back and grab a donut. I don't know. The, uh, um, the, I, I'd say. Buddy and the boys, if that's appropriate. That's, appropriate. Uh, that, uh, that's what I call it. <laughs> all right. Thank you for letting us come by. Um, I very much appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, small businesses like this are the bedrock of job creation in our state and, for that matter, in our country. And what they see, we were just talking in the back about what's happening in the economy. He says, well, I'm watching the numbers fairly closely. The boys, I guess, are more directly are watching the numbers fairly closely. Uh, because... That's what businesses have to do, and that's what individuals have to do. They've got to watch the numbers closely so they don't get ahead of themselves. If you do, it can be cataclysmic with a small business. There aren't a lot of cushions. you got to, uh, again, watch your numbers, both on the revenue side and on the expense side, on a daily basis. And so what, what we're looking at as a state is we go through the process of setting a family budget. Four million of us in South Carolinians come up with the numbers each year, and the last attempt that we have each year to impact the final number is with budget vetoes. And so I'm here to ask the people of the upstate to make their voice heard with their uh, respective representative or senator on the importance of taking this one last chance that we have to hold the line on spending. The reason that it's so important to do so is that if you look at the numbers over the last basically four years, South Carolina government's grown by about 43%. And it's been our contention that while government should grow, it shouldn't grow faster than the growth of people's paychecks and wallets. Because if government grows faster than the underlying economy, in time, something gives. In other words, if you didn't match up your numbers at the business level with your, your revenue coming in, with your expenses, and you grew your expenses way faster than you grew the number of jobs that you were contracting with, this business would cease to exist. And government obviously doesn't cease to exist. It never goes out of business. But what it does is it can cut right to past muscle and in, into bone when times are not so good, if you get ahead of yourselves in spending, or you can dramatically raise taxes. You can do one of those two things, but one of those two things happens in living in a balanced budget requirement, which is what we have at state level. And so what we said is we've gotten ahead of ourselves with regard to spending. Our last chance to impact spending in this financial year will be with budget vetoes. They got off to quite a roll on Friday, uh, and I'd give credit to Phil Schubman, to Eric Bedenfield, others who were sort of leading the charge of saying, wait a minute, this is our last chance. They may not be perfect vetoes, but it is truly our last chance impacting spending. And so basically three vetoes came up. Every one of them was sustained. And uh, at that point, leadership said, wait a minute, we're in trouble here. And they closed down shop for the weekend, said, let's adjourn, and off we are for the weekend. We'll go back into session tomorrow. And so what we're asking, again, is that people make their voice heard to the House member or senator on the importance of sustaining vetoes. Because if not, everybody links in together and says, I don't really care about what's happening on the opposite side of the state, but to protect my veto, I'll go ahead and support yours, and it devolves from there. Again, the reason as to why it's really important is got ahead of ourselves, and the degree to which we got ahead of ourselves is shown with this chart right here. In the entire southeast of the last two years, guess which state uh, basically grew spending the most? South Carolina. South Carolina was number one in the entire southeast over the last two years in the growth here on the spending side. So, you know, if we were mid-range, it would be one thing. But we were at the far end of the range. We grew government by basically 40%, well faster than, than people's paychecks and wallets, which makes it that much more important that, in fact, I think we hold the line here on the spending. Um, here's particularly why it's important now. We laid out four goals in our budget vetoes. Um, the first was, if you have a balanced budget requirement, you obviously can't run a deficit, Right? 
Well, there's a deficit built into this budget as it's now contemplated. Because what we know is that gas costs us more. I just spoke to a lady right, right here on the, 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 on the sidewalk who brought up how it was killing her driving an excursion and paying basically $4 a, a gallon for gas. And, and so what we know is that in education, they're projected to run a $20 million shortfall, and in corrections, they're projected to run an $8 million shortfall. If you go into a budget year, and while you wish gas was $1.50 a gallon, but you know it's three fifty instead, and you still bill your budget based on $1.50 gas, you're building a real deficit into that budget. And so since we know that our situation has changed, our point has been we know our numbers have changed. We have to build a realistic balance, a budget so that we, in fact, live up to the constitutionally balanced uh, budget requirement that this state has. So what we said was goal number one would be to close off this deficit. That's $28 million. And so we uh, said vetoes that won't be perfect, but rather than breaching this constitutional requirement of balanced budget, let's aim the first $28 million to close and off that, that deficit. Second was, the saying is, you know, if, you got, if you're in a hole, quit digging. Well, we got a $20 billion hole tied to unpaid for political promises in Columbia, about 10 on the retirement side, about 10 on the health care side. And to the credit of the General Assembly, last year they allocated about $50 million to say, tell you what, we're going to begin digging out of that hole. And the $50 million in a $20 billion hole is not where we need to get, but it's a step in the right direction. Well, unfortunately, in this budget, the same 50 that had gone in, basically it came back out. So $42 million was taken out of the first step toward beginning to pay for that, those unfunded political promises. We said what we can't do in addressing that problem is go backward. Because you take that $42 million out of beginning to do something about this $20 billion hole, we're digging our hole even deeper. So the second goal was can we do something about what's called OPIB um, funding? And so our, our, our second tier of vetoes was about closing that, that, that borrowing from last year. The third goal was $100 million toward uh, Medicaid. $100 million was borrowed from Medicaid this year, which serves the neediest of the needy in our state. And our point was, that doesn't make good sense. We have actually a proposal uh, to increase Medicaid spending. Why at the same time would we be borrowing three times the number or four times the number you're talking about increasing there with Medicaid? And the fourth would be annualizations. There are $161 million in borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. In other words, you begin a long-term program that has multi-year requirements. In other words, let's say you had some, uh, what's something to cost you for a while? What would be an example? A truck. A truck. Uh, whatever, a truck. <laughs> let's say it's going to last seven years. But you only got money for the first year's worth of payment on the truck. You say, that's a problem. That doesn't work. That's what an annualization is. It's, it's, you only got money for that first year's down payment on the house, not money for mortgage payments over 20 years, but you still commit to buying that house. And so there are $161 million. In an effort to scale down and to try and be very reasonable in our vetoes, we said, tell you what, we'll go for the two little things. That's all we'll do in terms of veto. We're not even going to go for the bigger goals of the $100 million in Medicaid or the $161 million in annualizations. We'll take a rifle shot and aim simply at those first two goals. And so we're trying to meet very much there in the middle. There have been some courageous folks, like I say, Eric and Philip, have really led the charge on this front in saying, look, it ain't perfect, but it is a step in the right direction. Can we support them on these vetoes? And what I would ask is that people do the same to their respective, you know, uh, house member centers, uh, and, and again, cousins on other corners of the state who might talk to a house or senate member, and that's our simple message of the day.